Okay, cool. I have been asked to deal with a blog that we learned about. It was written on February the 8th of this year, and I'll mention that we did not learn about it till just a few days ago. And I will mention that because that will come into play as we go through this. It is written by Keith Brenton, and I didn't read his other blogs, but uh, there, and I will say at least one thing about the latest one that he has written. It's interesting in light of the last lesson his first statement is the Brenton family needs your prayers because we need two miracles now I don't know and haven't read what the problems are within his family and we certainly can sympathize with whatever those problems are and we would pray that those problems are taken care of properly but miracles don't take place uh, so I will add that uh, in relationship to that and what we are going to say here is not intended to hurt them from a, in, in any way but it is an attempt to look at the truth of matters to see what truth is and to expose error this blog again written February 8th he titled it time to pray for my friends again it is interesting that it has the contending for the faith logo on the blog and he writes and I I'm going to and I probably will make some comments uh, as I read this there's going to be some responses to it that I will also read, including one from someone who is here. Uh, I'm sure you can't guess who that is, but uh, if you can't, he's sitting down there on the front pew there. But uh, he writes, in this instance, the friends I'm praying for are the folks preparing and gathering for the 2013 Spring Contending for the Faith Lectures. I had such hope when I saw on the sponsoring church's homepage that the topic this year would be Christ, the Great Controversialist. I dared to think that the practices of the past might be done away with in this year's lectures and that the presentations might actually be Christ-centered and elaborate on controversial teachings, life, death, and resurrection, the gospel that saves us. He says, but here is their list of topics and speakers. And I greatly fear that the topics, in many cases at least, indicate a focus on repeating questionable doctrines generated by men and attributed them to God as if Scripture relayed them from him word for word and no human logic or inference or deduction or conclusion was warranted. I ask you, did he make any conclusions? when he wrote that? Did he use any logic when he wrote that? Man-made comments? Or was that relayed word for word from the Bible to him? Hmm. Well, he goes on, and I suspect that these topics will serve as an opportunity 
for lambasting as apostate those who disagree with the speaker's logic, inferences, deductions, and conclusions, as well as disagreeing with their insistence that these constitute God's own doctrine. Again, did he use any logic, inferences, deductions, and conclusions when he wrote that about us? He goes on, I fear these things because of the tenor of these lectures in the past, 2012, 2011, 2010, etc. And so many of the names are the same, and the odds of a change of heart among so many are not very good, really. Did he happen to judge our hearts in that? Hmm. He goes on, so as speakers and attendees prepare, I will again be praying for them the same things I have prayed in years past. And these are the same things I pray for myself and anyone else who desires to speak about for and in partnership with God, his Son, and his Holy Spirit. I would, I would so very much like to be proven wrong about the things I fear. That is what he wrote. And I said, there's a lot that could be said about that, and we'll come back to some of the things, but uh, there's a response, uh, again, the same day, by someone who calls themselves Baltimore Guy. And he writes, it is amazing to think that the late Ira Y. Rice Jr. would be too moderate for his spiritual heirs, which were he alive today. You know, uh, let me just stop there. The elders of the congregation I work with oversaw the work of Brother Ira Y. Rice until his death. I think that we could safely say, and of course, Brother Brown was the owner of Contending for the Faith, whom the late R.Y. Rice sold or gave the paper to. I think we could say that he would not be too moderate for us. I think he spoke on this lectureship on a regular basis. I know he spoke on the lectureship that I direct until his death. I see no reason to think why that would have changed. Maybe this Baltimore guy did not know Brother Rice as well as some of those who are here. But he goes on to write, that I read the first volume of his autobiography years ago and found some surprises. Rice was a very early advocate of racial equality in churches of Christ. That's uh, true, and I wonder why he thinks that that would make Brother Rice too moderate for us today. Hmm. He goes on. Uh, he was also a committed pacifist and was questioned by the FD, FBI during World War II. I know there are differences in relationship to the war question. I many would disagree with Brother Rice and his pacifism regarding that matter, but we knew that before this and before his death, and how many of us withdrew fellowship for him or thought that he was too moderate because of that. No one that I know of. He goes on, I told a friend that once, that once, and he commented that Rice was a pacifist regarding carnal warfare, but not warfare among Christians. That's the end of what his comments were, and uh, at least at this time. And Brother Rice did 
believe in contending for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. And that meant whether the individual claimed to be a member of the Church of Christ or not. He believed in doing what the Bible said in that regard. Uh, so nothing that he wrote justifies what he said at the beginning. But who cares? Then a response was written by Jeff Richardson. This was the next day, February 9th. And I will say that his comments are very good. <laughs> uh, I do not know him, at least not that I can remember. But he wrote, after reviewing last year's lecture topics, I can see why you fear. God's truths were spoken. Denominational apostasy brought out, in, brought out into the light. Your idea of inclusion and unity shown for what it really is, sin. May we always remember what a believer in Christ is one who gladly receives and accepts the teaching of Christ, one who doesn't question but simply does. You desire a change of heart. And that was change of heart was in quotes. You remind me of those in, Act, in John 6. After Jesus had told them who he was, they had a change of heart. In verse 60 and following, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Jesus knew that they were complaining, and he said, Does this offend you? There were those in his day who would not gladly receive his words, just as there is in ours. That's exactly what a denominational body is, a group that has become offended by the teachings of Christ, and they seek to honor him there way. I wonder if Jesus ever had anything to say about such people. I think Matthew 7.21 speaks to this, and he quotes that. And he goes on to say, uh, those who do things their way are practicing lawlessness. He, he is describing those who do not worship him in spirit and in truth, and truth is all capitalized there. He is describing a denominational body. You fear that this year's lectures will once again repeat the same, quote, questionable made man doctrines, end quote. Without question, the Bible teaches of only one body, that being the body of Christ, his church, the one he built and died for. The only questionable man-made doctrine is yours, KB, the inclusion, quote, inclusion, end quote, of man-made churches. I would say amen to what he wrote. Uh, so, Keith Brenton responded to him. And this is on February 10th. Jeff, I've been blogging my reasons for disagreeing with exclusivism, legalism, and judgmentalism for almost nine years now. You've been along for the ride the last three or four years. I don't see any great chance that we will persuade each other. <laughs> but here is something that we can agree upon and do together. We can pray for those who desire to speak for God. Pray that they and those who hear them will be led closer to the way, the truth, and the life. Let me say, now, for prayers to be heard, an individual has to be righteous. And when one is arguing for inclusion, the inclusion of denominationalism and such, those individuals are not righteous. And their prayer, prayers will not go past the sound of their voice. God will not hear them. He turns his face against them. But I thought it was interesting in that response. 
We can pray for those who desire to speak for God. Well, in one sense, we do speak for God in the sense that we allow God's word and we speak God's word and what he says as recorded within the pages of the New Testament. If he means by speak for God that we are going to go away from God's word and speak our own will and our own wishes as some do, then he needs to prove that we have done such. And I would like to see him try. Well, Baltimore guy comes in again. This is still on February 9th. And he writes, Jeff, if only one of the many competing sectarian groups is the one true church, you can rest assured that it is not the CFTT game. Now, I'm sure he meant CFTF and just hit T instead of F on that last one. If only one is going to make it, you've definitely put your money on the wrong horse. I would say that there is only one that's going to make it. It's the one that's recorded in the pages of the New Testament. And none of others will make it. We have the obligation to prove all things, to find out what is right and what is wrong, and follow that one way. And that one way is right and cannot be wrong. Following that one way, as recorded and revealed within the pages of the New Testament, will not make us a sectarian group. When people st start trying to follow their own ways and their own doctrine, their own ideas, that's when you become a sectarian group. Now then, he wants to say that we are not and that we have become a sectarian group. Prove it. Where is the evidence of such? Show us in the Bible where what we have taught, what we have practiced, what we advocate is wrong according to God's word. That one way that is right and cannot be wrong. But you don't see any of that in this. None of those who are responding, using any Bible, not looking at anything that is being taught here, they are even assuming what is going to be taught and judging our hearts in relationship to it. Well, Jeff Richardson responded to what Baltimore guy wrote by saying, well, Baltimore guy, which one should I bet on? I only read about one in Scripture. I know Christ only built one. I can see from Scripture what they believed and taught and how they were organized, how they worshipped, and how they became a part of it, and who added them to it. So, Baltimore guy, which of the many differing and perverted man-made doctrines should I follow? Amen. So Baltimore guy responded, still February the 9th. Jeff, it, if it, or Jeff, if that's the way it worked, I'd go with Roman Catholicism before I'd go with the CFTF crowd. Now, brethren, that's the type of attitude that we're dealing with. I would go with Roman Catholicism before I'd go with the CFTF crowd. Let me make one comment. David Brown Spring, I'd like rather that he go with Roman Catholicism and what makes him think he'd be able to go with those who believe what we believe. Obviously, he doesn't want to believe it, so just um, let him go on with Roman Catholics. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. But he goes on to say, I'm part of Christ's church. 
the one that takes no account of sectarian divisions like the ones CFTF creates and perpetrates. The one Jesus was referring to when he said that wherever two or three are get, were gathered together in his name, he was there or he was there with them in their midst. Every disciple of Jesus is my brother or sister. And since every one or and since ev and since one day every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Christ is Lord, that eventually takes in everyone. That's exactly right. That is universalism. He goes on to say, we know that the saved will be more than anyone can number or count. No offense, but it wouldn't be all that hard to count the ever-dwindling CFTF fellowship. I wonder if he ever has read John the sixth chapter. Because at the beginning, you know, there were multitudes that followed Jesus. Thousands of people following him. And as you read on into that chapter, you start seeing Jesus' teachings. And, in fact, Jeff had mentioned John 6. But at the end of that, everybody left. You had thousands of people, and thousands of people left, Thus, that must make Jesus an ever-dwindling fellowship crowd that should not be followed. Now, if that's not the reasoning of this Baltimore guy, then what is it? And so much so that Jesus turned to his apostles, will you leave also? And of course, Peter's response, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. even though the multitudes left Jesus. Jesus and his teachings were right. And the multitudes were wrong. Let me also make a comment about this idea of where two or three were gathered in, my, in the name of Christ, Christ was in the midst of them. That's from Matthew, the 18th chapter, and verse 20. In case some people didn't know, which apparently their usage of it didn't, or else they just simply have not read the context of the passage. You know, it, it, and this is kind of a side, it amazes me so many times that we are so often accused of as they call it, proof texting, and taking a passage out of its context and ignoring the context of it and, what it, and thus what it means? Why don't they do that with their own doctrines? Matthew, the 18th chapter and verse 20, that states where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them does not have any reference to worship. It deals with corrective church discipline. And we'll come back to this in a minute, but there is that process of discipline where you take in that process one or two so that at the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established and Jesus within that context says where those individuals are, those two or three in my name, I'm in their midst, I'm with them, I am in fellowship with them and that individual who has transgressed the word is not in fellowship with me. Now that's the context. Why do they have the right to pull a passage totally away from its context and use it for something that it has absolutely no reference to? And we're the ones who proof text. Well, I've got to go on. On February 10th, 
Jeff Richardson responded. And he says, let's remember those who are gathered together in his name are those who whatsoever you do in word or deed, do in the name of Jesus Christ. To do something in someone's name is to act by his authority. Amen. I would guess that you believe whatever you do and what and you say it's being done for Christ, you're doing it in his name, might want to rethink that one. Why Catholicism? I'm sure that you know that nothing like Catholicism was even known until some time in the third century. We know from Scripture that the Lord's Church was indeed established on Pentecost, A.D. 30 to 33 of Acts 2. And yet you would still pick Catholicism? That's amazing. You will find nothing even close to it in Scripture. I would suggest Matthew 7, 13 through 29 for your personal study. No offense. <laughs> You're right, amen. Um, and he goes on. By the way, I have no authority to include or exclude anyone. Again, amen. And let me mention a certain bulletin article that went around and that was, that appeared in a certain Memphis School of Preaching bulletin, at least the congregation that oversees them, about drawing someone's circle of fellowship. We don't have a right to include or exclude anyone. What we do is we have to recognize God's standard as to who is in fellowship with God and who is not in fellowship with God. But he goes on to say that Christ has all authority and he has shown us what one needs to do to be a part of his kingdom. He makes the call, not us. By his word, we can see how one enters the kingdom. Those who reject his way will be lost, but for some reason, you and KB seem to think you can include whoever you desire. Sounds like something a Pharisee would do. Yeah. So Baltimore guy had to respond. And he says, but the CFTF creed was not invented until well into the 20th century. The Catholics have you beat by 1,600 years. To which Jeff Richardson responded, what creed are you talking about? The Church of Christ has no creed, only the Bible. Amen. And the Bible was written well before the Cat Roman Catholicism ever came into existence. All of those took place from February 8th through February 10th. On February 19th, a certain individual by the name of David Brown responded. And he said, Jeff, no one opposes logic until logic opposes them. The misguided brother and those like him you are answering are as biblically ignorant, disrespectful of Bible authority, Colossians 3.17, inconsistent and illogical in most cases as they come. He writes, quote, I've been blogging my reasons for disagreeing with exclusivism, legalism, and judgmentalism for almost nine years now, end quote. How is it possible for that for, quote, nine years, end quote, one can do as he has done, but fail to see that in so doing, quote, blogging my reasons, end quote, that he has, one, engaged in some form of reasoning, illogical though it may be, two, reached conclusions about others and things, although many of those conclusions are not, A, warranted by the right division of the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15, or B, by adequate evidence, or C, by credible witnesses. 
but he has judged others, and thereby he has three engaged in what he labels judgmentalism. Four practiced, quote, legalism. One must conform to his way of seeing persons and things or else. And five, when they do not judge and conclude as he does, he excludes them from his fellowship circle, thereby practicing exclusivism. If such a person is not in sad shape, what would it take for him to be in sad shape? What is it that prevents him from seeing that he is practicing on others what he condemns in them? Whatever the answer is, the Lord has a term by which he has labeled such characters. Hypocrite. I believe in allowing the New Testament of Jesus Christ to, to determine who is right and who is wrong and base my conclusions about them accordingly, John 7, 24 and 12, 48. That is the way that is right and cannot be wrong. If the inspired apostle uh, Paul could preach the word, and in so doing he, quote, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, end quote, then I am on safe ground in doing the same thing. Acts 24, 25, see also 17, 2, 18, 4, and 19. It would be interesting, to say the least, to see how this fellow and his friends engage in doing what Paul authorized all Christians to do in the way he told them to do it and for the reason or reasons he authorized them to do it when he practices 1 Thessalonians 5.21. How can anyone comply with the inspired apostle's direction is is the preceding passage without logical reasoning from the biblical information provided for us in order to determine what is or determine what and who is right and what and who is wrong including the beliefs and actions of one's own self now if he attempts to answer that or what i have written in this blog see if he does it without one exercising his rational powers, such as they are, thereby, too, reaching some sort of a conclusion, thus making a judgment about me and what I have written in this blog, three, expressing his judgment about me, and four, having judged me to be wrong, excluding me from whatsoever it is that he calls fellowship with God. When he does that, he will condemn himself although I doubt he will recognize it. But if he does not judge me to be wrong regarding what I have written in this blog or elsewhere, what is the point of all that he has recorded? So on the 19th, Keith Brenton responded. Thank you for your comments, David. You might have shown me the courtesy of directing them to me, since they are about me. And many people would have construed that action as one recommended by Jesus going to your brother in Matthew 5, 24 and 18, 15 and following. Now get this. Ah. But I would be guilty of that omission by posting this blog article, wouldn't I? Tell me, did reading my opinion of the lectures here in public make you favorably disposed to my point of view? Was it persuasive? If the purpose of the lectures is to convince brothers in error and save their souls, then why is it not done in, in the order Jesus recommended to the one who errs first, one-on-one, -on -one, then with a couple or three witnesses, and then before the church? I stop there. Did he do that? No. Now, what is that? Hypocrisy. And the, I was, the funny thing that, about it is he recognizes it and does it anyway as if, who cares? I'm being a hypocrite. I know I did that. And yet, oh well. I, 
I don't understand that, I got to admit. But then, let's deal with this aspect. And the time's getting short, but uh, Matthew, the 18th chapter, 15 following. Jesus gives a process. Go to the individual. If he doesn't hear you, take one or two witnesses. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he still doesn't hear you, tell it to the church. If he doesn't hear the church, let him be unto thee as heathen man is public. There is a question as to whether or not this is dealing with personal sin or not. Some have argued that it is not dealing with personal sin because there are some manuscripts that leave out in Matthew the 18th chapter and verse 15, if anyone sin against you. And so, uh, and I believe the New American Standard, if you look at that, removes the against you part. And so it's, if anyone sins, then this is a process. Well, number one, the omission of those words against you is not justified. I had just simply not. Number two, even if, they were not there in the original. They are, but even if they weren't, look at the, I hate to use this word, context. Again, what had just taken place? Here's an individual who sins. Should I forgive him? Well, what if he sins again? And Jesus' teaching is, you forgive an individual who sins against you even seven times, 70 times. And then there's this discussion. The whole context is a personal sin. And so even if, in verse 15, those two words against me or against you are omitted, the context still demands that it is personal sin and not public. But he didn't even do what he says should be done. Well, he goes on. Did I call brothers out by name and slander them or simply link to their works as evidence for my opinion? Notice that he has accused every one of you who have spoken and will speak, including me, as being slanderers. Now let him prove it. Then he says, did I fail to offer to pray for those with whom I disagree? I see the matter differently than you, but I do not hold my logic to be of equal weight to Scripture. Who does? He needs a study as to what logic is all about, doesn't he? He thinks someone's conclusions are logic. Instead of recognizing implication and inference and the difference between the two, God implies something. It's my responsibility to infer what God has implied. Now, it's not scripture because I infer it. It is scripture because God implied it. It is authoritative because God has implied it. And it's my responsibility to reason correctly. I think I read someplace in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 about come let us, well, let's mark that out. Emotionalize together. How, how's that? Let's change it to that. Now, it's come now let us reason together, saith the Lord. God expects us to prove all things. How do we prove anything? How does Keith Brenton prove anything in the Bible is applicable to him? He can't without using logic and the doctrine of implication. 
the doctrine of invocation. Let me address this question directly to him. Does he believe that the Bible teaches that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins? Now, yes or no? Or as they used to say, shake or nod. Now, is he going to say, no, Saul of Tarsus did not repent in the process of becoming a Christian? How does he know that? Is he going to say, well, yes, certainly. He's going to know that. Then, if he answers yes, because the Scriptures imply it, and he's inferred what the Scriptures implied. But nowhere in the New Testament does it explicitly say, just so many words, Saul of Tarsus and the process of becoming a Christian repented of their sins. But I guarantee you he's going to say Saul repented of his sins. Now, let him tell us how he knows that. He didn't assume it. You left that assumption. Notice the difference of assumption. An assumption. I asked one individual dealing with implication, the Bible's application to us. Can you tell me anything that applies to you in the Bible without using implication? He said yes. And then quote, went on to quote John 3.16, and he implied, he said, I am a whosoever, I am a part of the whosoever, and therefore that verse applies to me. I simply said, thank you for proving my point. And he continued to argue against implication. Well, going on, he says, uh, and he continues on with his ideas of logic. Uh, Perhaps, brother, you can explain how yours is superior and infallible, as your comment implies. David, do you believe you're infallible now? He shook his head. Uh, if uh, he does, I'm sure that Jody will correct him. <laughs> Simply because we say the Bible is right and we can reason correctly from the Bible does not mean that we are infallible. And I believe Brother Denham mentioned that in his lesson. And then he goes on to say, or we're using I generally in the place of we or one or a person in those sentences, I refer to, quote, I believe in allowing the New Testament of Jesus Christ to determine who is right and who is wrong and base my conclusions about them accordingly, John 7, 24 and 1248. That is the way that is right and cannot be wrong. If the inspired apostle Paul could preach the word and in so doing he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, then I am on safe ground and doing the same thing. Acts 24, 25. See also 17, 2, 18, 4, and 19. End quote. Now notice this. It would help if you substantiated your claims against my logic with actual examples rather than simply bullet pointing the accusations and throwing in a few parenthetical slurs. What kind of proof is that? Guilty by insinuation? What did he do the entire time? What evidence has he presented in regards to one accusation that he has made? Well, again, I'm a hypocrite. I don't care about it. I'm going to go on and do it. Then he says, am I judging you? I am judging the words and actions I've seen before, and I disagree that they are in harmony with Scripture. I'm offering you the opportunity to judge for yourself, Acts 4, 19. Amazing that he can make a judgment about us and it's right for him to do so but when we use the scriptures and applying them in relationship to what he has said and taught then we're wrong we're exclusive judgmental was he judgmental I guess not because he can do it and we can't and he can, says brother I will continue to pray for you and your colleagues Your souls are worth much to me because they are precious to Christ at the price of his own life. I love you and feel compelled to pray for you, and I hope you will do the same for me. Lacking your conviction of 
of the inerrancy of personal logic and being a terrible, fallible person beset right now with more kinds of stress and temptation than I can resist alone, I can use all the prayers I can get. There's not been any responses to that. David, because of the uh, aspects of the lectureship that were immediate at this time, has not had a chance to respond, but I think he's going to. David, you want to add something? Uh, just real quickly, I, I just literally couldn't. That came, what, Tuesday? Uh, February Wednesday? 19th at 6 p.m. So I wrote that and sent it off, and then everything started. Uh, it's hard to get enthusiastic about responding to much ado about nothing, which he's offered. Except for the good of those who might read it otherwise. <laughs> Gary? Uh, Gary Summers, Winter Park, Florida. He began uh, this blog by saying that he was going to pray for his friends. I'm not sure how I got to be a friend. I don't recall ever meeting him, and I don't know why he did that, but I would suggest that if he really wants to be a friend, he take the material and he brought this up himself, that I wrote against Edward Fudge in his book, The Fire That Consumes, and show me where I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, Fudge wrote that, and he is considered uh, uh, high in uh, certain circles, denominational circles. His book is touted. Some brethren believe it. It's fatal error. And so if, if I am wrong in that, uh, then he should tell me, he can read all of the pages and analyze it and say, here's where you're wrong. And that would is be a, a friend. That's true, but there's an important point in this. Because on the right hand of this page, there's blogs to behold, and he lists several people, Edward Fudge being one of them. Uh, listing him as what? One of these blog. blogs to behold. Oh, he recommends it. That's his recommendation. Okay. Blogs. Well, then so. he really needs to analyze what I wrote. <laughs> and uh, as a friend, uh, tell me where I'm wrong because Fudge denies that hell, as defined in the Bible, exists. Now, also, in connection with one other thing that you said, uh, Edward Fudge didn't contact me when he wrote the book, and I didn't contact him when I wrote the review. It's in the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we don't have to go to someone who has publicly uh, written and foisted upon the brotherhood and uh, religion in large false doctrine. That we is, have the right to oppose it. That is a misuse of Matthew 18, right. 15 and following, which he tries to do, which he himself would not be willing to do in contacting us in writing the blog but we were wrong in doing all of this. We'll, Gene, have to, we'll have to hurry through these comments. Just so. real quick, Gene Hill from Indianola, Mississippi. I would like to in, invite Kevin, what's his last name again? Brenton. Kevin Brenton to uh, uh, an analysis of the lectureship book. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will front the money for it. It's Keith Brenton. Keith Brenton, okay. Yes. And uh, I'll be glad to front the cost for the lectureship book. I'll pay for the... Uh, I have to check with my financial chairman first, but I'm sure we can front the money for the lectureship book and the shipping and handling to this gentleman so he can take the time and analyze it and extend to us the courtesy of telling us wherein we're wrong in detail. I hope he picks yeah. on Daniel first, but be glad for him to, to <laughs> take the book and analyze it, and I'll pay for it. I'll be glad to pay for it. And, I, and I, I won't look at it as a cost. I mean, if he never does anything, it'll be seed planted somewhere for somebody to get after he's dead and passes on his library. Skip Francis, uh, I'm probably the only liberal preacher on this, uh, <laughs> in this group, probably the one of the ones he would have liked, except for I'm just talking about being from liberal Kansas. I was sent a cartoon not very long ago that it was a young fellow and he was holding this Bible and it said, look, the Bible for dummies. And the guy says, what's in it? He said, John 3.16. This is the heart of the problem with so many of these people. 
If you'll notice, right at the very beginning of his blog, he began to talk about the fact that we should be up here all talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We have been. We have been. But I might also point out that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is contained in four books of the gospel. It's mentioned in all of the other ones per, pretty much. But there are 27 books in the, in the New Testament, 22 of them written for the primary purpose of dealing with error in the church. Why do they get so upset at the fact that we deal with error in the church at these lectureships when the vast majority of the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is about dealing with error in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, comment about that. It's a fact that from Genesis to Revelation, every book centers upon the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Every lesson that has been presented here has dealt with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Whether that specific act in history was mentioned or not. When we talk about mechanical instruments and music, we are talking about, and the sin of using those mechanical instruments and music, we are talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Because he, his blood was shed for the new testament that's all of his teachings and when you teach about god's word whether you're teaching about the church the worship the organization whatever you deal with end times it's all dealing and goes back to the death burial and resurrection of our lord and savior jesus christ so i would say we have been in this entire lectureship I just wanted to ask a question to your name and oh. uh, Sean Francis, Liberal Kansas. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask a question to those that are here today. Um, going back to the very beginning of this blog, with the way he has posted it, I wanted to read from Matthew chapter six, verse five and six. It says, "And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites." For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Has this man not uh, posted this in order to be seen by others? Uh... Maybe not in that sense, uh, but he did not post it for us and to teach us. Uh, this goes back to uh, what Brother Summers was saying. He starts out, he's going to pray for his friends. Uh, I was on those lectureships that he mentioned, 2012, 2011, 2010, etc. He's never contacted me. Where's the error that I taught? Show, point out that error. That's what a true friend's going to do. Instead of get, going to a blog and posting it for everyone else to see, but not us. And he calls his friends. Some place I heard with friends like that. Oh well, you know the rest of it. I think our time is past time. So, and. I do appreciate the comments, uh, even though I did most of the speaking. So, <laughs> but the comments at the end do appreciate. And you know, as I started, he does have there are some problems within his family. I don't know what they were. I didn't have a chance to read that. We do hope that those things are taken care of in a good way, in the proper way. There's not going to be a miracle that happens, though, to do it. I assure him that. <laughs>